You're listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. This is season six, episode four, The Artist in the Modern World. Lewis Hyde is a scholar, essayist, translator, cultural critic, and writer whose scholarly work focuses on the nature of imagination, creativity, and property. His book, The Gift, Creativity and the Artist in the Modern World, is now considered a classic. Written over 25 years ago, this book is even more necessary today than when it first appeared. The Gift brilliantly orchestrates a defense of the value of creativity and of its importance in a culture increasingly governed by money and overrun with commodities. I had the privilege of sharing a conversation with Lewis on the ideas outlined in his book and how they impact the working artist in today's world. This is my conversation with author Lewis Hyde on the artist in the modern world. Lewis, thank you so much for joining us on the Makers and Mystics podcast. It's an honor to have you on the show today. Happy to be here. I have been reading your book, The Gift, for several years, as many of our listeners have as well. And it's one of those books that I continue to come back to time and time again. And each time I reread it, I unpack more and more wisdom that I'm really grateful to have at my disposal. Glad to hear it. (laughs) Now, this book I know in our community has been an anchor for our creative journey. And I know for so many artists and so many makers and honestly, so many spiritual seekers out there as well, this book, The Gift, has just been pivotal. And you wrote it in, well, you published it first in 1983. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. So I was writing it in the late 1970s and uh, came out in 1983. And I know for us, here we are in 2019, and this book is still offering such a wellspring of wisdom to the artist in the modern world. Well, you know, I think this is partly because though I wrote the book, what I was doing was summarizing and gathering material that is ancient. And so a lot of the wisdom in there is not mine. It's things that I found and passed along. And that was always my hope, that uh, I was writing something that was not about a particular moment in my life, but about a kind of pattern and a vocabulary around exchange that was ancient as well as modern. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, something we've been talking about in our community a lot lately is this tension between the artist and how the artist is to live and function and not only survive, but also to thrive in the modern world. And you put forth what I recognized as three different paradigms, if you will, of how the artist can work through these tensions. One is for the artist to take on a second job that still allows them to create in the after hours which you pointed out that Ezra Pound and and I think Walt Whitman did that at one point in their life. And then you talked about another approach is to find patrons or supporters to help the artist to be able to do their work. And then thirdly, you talked about artists learning how to make money from their work without actually killing the art or the integrity of the art itself. Could you talk a little bit about those three points with us? So I guess to back off and explain why they arise, the assumption of the book is that the practice of art is really different in kind than the things we do when we try to make money. And, you know, if you hire me to clean up your yard and I have a hedge clipper and a spade, you know, I work by the hour and I get paid by the hour and I I do something that alters the world and so forth. And uh, it's easy to put a value on that in terms of my time and materials. But a lot of artistic practice just doesn't fit the model very well, the commercial model. And so rather than say artists should figure out how to make their work fit, my beginning point is is that there isn't a fit, and artists should at least relax about that and realize it's not their fault if they can't make uh, money directly from their art. So then, yes, the question arises. It's not just modern, though. It, it, it's more marked in the modern period, but I think it's been a problem for centuries, of how a working artist fits into a commercial world or doesn't. And I suppose the one 
option you left out of your nice little summary list is uh, the option of voluntary poverty <laughs> or maybe involuntary poverty. Mm -hmm. There are artists who just retreat to a cabin someplace and and uh, try to live so simply that the problem of of making your way is reduced at least uh, as far as it can be. And then, yes, um, I suppose to get quickly to the other poll, happily, it isn't necessarily the case that there's a disconnect. You know, beginning in the 17th century, we've invented ways for creative people to commercialize their work, particularly around the questions of copywriting things and putting a patent on them. And so happily, there are some artists who are able to do this. And um, bravo for them. I, I wish I were one of them. But, um, <laughs> you know, somebody like E.L. Doctorow, who was a, a great novelist, um, or, or uh, Philip Roth, uh, you know, there are people who, who happily join the two economies. And I, I presume even they must have to figure out some way to sequester themselves so that their work is not simply commercial. But then for most of us, these other paths are more likely. I am now retired from teaching, but for many years I taught uh, mostly creative writing. I taught at Harvard, and then I taught at Kenyon College in Ohio. And teaching creative writing is not the same as writing. So it really is a second job. And I was lucky enough for many years to work half time, which meant that I could really devote myself to teaching in the fall semesters each year and devote myself to my own work in the spring and summer. And then finally, um, cultures that recognize the fact of this disconnect and who value the things that are not well supported by the marketplace have to invent ways to support those things. And it's not just art, but um, most spiritual life falls into this category. Uh, you, you know, sometimes you can make money as a minister, but or a, a, a Dharma teacher, but uh, that money tends to be contributions. So spiritual life, a lot of uh, healing practices, a lot of education, uh, there are many things that are not well fitted to the marketplace. And so you need to have gift exchange institutions, as it were. You need to have community support, some way in which the community tithes itself or taxes itself to shift one kind of wealth to another kind of wealth. So traditionally in in aristocratic cultures or theocratic cultures, it was the church or the crown that would be patrons to artists. Mm -hmm. uh, if you go to, to Venice or Rome, you see the great uh, works that were made in the Renaissance, all funded by the church or by aristocrats. In this country, it's been more puzzling because part of the point of the founding of this country was a great split from both of those traditions. You know, Protestant simplicity was the mark of the church and a disconnect between the power of government and anything that citizens might do was another mark. So it, it took us a long time to figure out some ways to to have patronage in this country. I, don't, I really don't think we've fully figured it out yet, but mm -hmm. it, it tends to fall into two categories. There are private wealth, like the MacArthur Foundation or the Guggenheim Foundation, or, you know, there are patrons who make money in the mining or forestry or whatever, uh, real estate, and then happily convert that money into, into support for non-commercial enterprises. And then there's also the public purse. And so uh, the federal government and state governments and cities and towns sometimes chip in to support creative work. That's that's a short map of some of the paths to be taken. It seems to me that part of establishing a broader social environment that understands and supports the artist begins by cultivating communities who show us why the contributions of beauty and of art not only benefit us personally, but also socially as well. And I've often said in my talks that it's important for us to understand that the human being needs beauty as well as bread. Yeah, absolutely. But I mean, in a way, you, you mentioned the need for a community that recognizes this. And um, so all young artists should be aware of this fact that you need to be surrounded by people who understand what you do and who do similar things and value it 
you know, we all swim inside of different stories about why we are doing what we're doing and how nice to be surrounded by people who have the same narrative. I sometimes have been lucky enough to go to the McDowell Colony, which is a, a retreat place for artists of all kinds in New Hampshire. It's one of many artist colonies in the United States. But one of the sweet things about being at such a place, at, at McDowell, there are always maybe 20 or 30 artists. And so everybody around you is dedicated to doing the same kind of work and has at the back of their mind the same story about why it matters. And it's just invigorating. Whereas if you're alone, you know, in New York City, where money is the currency of all things, uh, you can sometimes lose your way. Mm -hmm. And yes, often artists do tend to feel isolated or alone. And that's really at the heart of what we're establishing in our community here through the Makers and Mystics podcast and through our events and retreats with The Breath and the Clay is to create a culture of camaraderie and mutual support of those following a similar path as our own. And, you know, part of our DNA is drawing connections between the spiritual life and the creative life and how they interact with one another. And you mentioned how people making their way through a spiritual vocation could be similar to the artist's path. And I think even fundamentally, there is a lot of natural interplay between those two worlds because I think art speaks to the spiritual and appeals to that deeper place of our human experience. It's absolutely true that, that spiritual communities often have to operate in the same way as artistic communities. I think, you know, the two are distinct, that to have a meditation practice doesn't necessarily make you an artist or even make you a better artist if you're already one. But, um, but there, there, there are many places where there are overlaps, particularly the degree to which spiritual practice helps you see the world freshly. Uh, and leave your baggage behind. Mm -hmm. And that's often something that an artist is trying to do, to be at the front edge of his or her own imagination and to see what arises. I want to ask you a question that I'm really curious to see what you would think about, because as we mentioned at the beginning of the interview, this book first came out in 1983. And I know that even in your own conclusion, at least in the version of the book that I have, you talked about how even at that point in your study, some of your own conclusions had changed or some of your own thoughts had developed. And now I'm looking at this as we're reading it in 2019. And I know that today's marketplace, even though it's, it's similar in some ways, it certainly offers more opportunities for the artists to make a living from their work with the internet, and that comes with positives and negatives. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, sometimes there's a pressure that comes with this opportunity that some could even feel that if you're not making a living from your art, then your art must not be of value. And I've kind of been of the persuasion that neither uh, making a living validates nor invalidates the value of art. But I'm curious what your perspective would be on this now, having published this in 1983. Here we are in 2019. The world's changed quite a bit. How has that affected your perspective on your own writing? Well, maybe two or three things to say. I mean, first of all, the conclusion to the original book partly was out to say that the process of writing that book in a way made me calm down about <laughs> the disconnect between the commercial world and the artistic world and kind of accept that I also had to make a living. <laughs> I mean, I suppose when I began it, I was a bit of a... No, the wild man who's not going to give in to any market forces at all. And, um, <laughs> yes. You know, after I was done with that book was when I began to teach. So there's that. But then two things to say. One is that as the digital internet arose, several things happened. One is that it became a kind of nice proof of some of the concepts of the book because the internet allowed for some commons communities to arise that never had been there before. I mean, a simple and obvious example is the rise of Wikipedia as a source of knowledge. And Wikipedia is entirely a voluntary-based uh, institution. And people give their time to it for whatever reason, and then, uh, you know, we get things back from it. I actually give them some money every year because I think it's a wonderful thing and needs to be supported. So the point is simply the the, the Internet 
has been a kind of proof of concept sometimes around gift communities. Then you mentioned that it has complicated the way artists earn their living. And you're right to say in both good and bad ways. I mean, it used to be that the copyright system was kind of easy to enforce because it had a physical side to it, that if I copyrighted a book, there was actually a physical object that we could see if somebody was pirating it or if people were stealing my work. But with the digital internet, it's been much harder to see where things go and uh, almost impossible to enforce at some level. So sometimes this has been good in that it's given the old gatekeepers, uh, the record industry, you know, had a whole series of gatekeepers and a young musician can now begin to post things online and find an audience and uh, elude all those gatekeepers. At the same time, the puzzle remains about how to how to either make money from that or accept that you're not going to. So it is cut both ways. And, you know, there are still artists. I mean, I think of a poet like Elizabeth Bishop, you know, who wrote very slowly, very few poems in her lifetime. And, you know, the internet would have been no help for her. Uh, <laughs> and it's still no help for her. I mean, her her work gets posted without permission online. So her estate loses out. So in a way, we're still trying to figure out how to domesticate the internet so that it benefits the people who actually should be benefited. Mm -hmm. I've often called it the Wild West of our modern day. (laughs) Yeah, yeah. Well, I want to bring something into the conversation that I wrote recently on my own Facebook page because I think it's pertinent to our conversation of gift exchange and the artist way. But in my post, I asked the question, why is it we demand joy, elation, ecstasy, transcendence, and revelation from the artist, yet we are willing to let them starve to give it to us? And I was surprised when this post got close to 50 shares and over 70 comments of people both for and against the position of supporting the artist. And, you know, I didn't post this as an accusation, uh, nor did I mean it as a plea to establish some kind of welfare for the artist. But judging by the response, it showed me that there are a lot of emotions surrounding this issue of where the artist fits in our modern world. Yeah. You know, I have to wonder, the response you got um, may reflect, I think there's a lot of suffering out there of young artists who, I mean, around me, my own experience has been America has thousands of serious artists of real talent working all the time who really do not get recognized and do not find a way to to be with dignity in the world. And I think there's a lot of confusion around why that is and a lot of anger. So you always touch a chord when you begin to address that, <laughs> the, the <laughs> fact that so many artists are really unsupported. and. Yeah, that is what we go to art for, is, is somehow to to see the world freshly or to be revitalized or even to be depressed in a way that is, feels like the right depression at the present moment. <laughs> Artists don't always up- uplift us. Sometimes they show us how grim it really is. Yes. <laughs> and I think it's that ability to speak to our emotions, both the ecstatic or the transcendent, and then also those darker parts of our human experience that sets art apart from the work of the plumber or the lawn man economy that we talked about a few minutes ago. Yeah. And this reminds yeah. me of something that you wrote in your introduction when you said, even if we have paid a fee at the door of the museum or concert hall, when we are touched by a work of art, something comes to us which has nothing to do with the price. Yeah. And then later on in the book, You began to talk about the artist's gift, not only in terms of the work itself, but that the talent or the muse or the inspiration is a gift bestowed upon the artist. And, you know, in our modern rationalist society, any concept of a muse or a spiritual gift or something being bestowed upon the artist from the outside is sometimes frowned upon, you know, but I don't think that we can get away from that aspect of art that touches mystery 
and comes to us from some otherworldly place. I'm curious what your thoughts are on this. Yeah, so, you know, in the introduction to the book, I'm trying to lay out a few simple reasons why we might speak about artistic practice as a kind of gift exchange. And so I pause over the simple fact that we speak of somebody who has a talent as being gifted. Then there are two ways in which I think we mean that. First of all, talent itself is not something you can get by trying harder. If you have a talent, you can try harder and perfect it and make it, uh, you, you can serve your talent and that's important. So there is a place for uh, your own actions. But we all know if we've met somebody who's really gifted at mathematics or gifted at song or gifted at uh, with language, <laughs> these people have something you don't have. And how nice for the rest of us if they get to do it right. Um, so there's that. Yeah. And then also, secondly, when one works on an art project of any kind, there are things that come to you that you did not expect. In fact, it only gets interesting, I think, if something comes to you that you didn't expect. I mean, again, if you've hired me to clip your hedge, I know exactly what I'm going to do all day long, and I <laughs> hope I know what it looks like at the end of the day. But if I'm setting out to write a poem or an essay or paint a painting, um, partly what's going on is I'm, I'm giving myself over to the materials and to the path, and then I'm trying to be alert and attentive to what happens as I work. And the real pleasures come when something occurs that could not have been predicted. And there's no way not to think of that as as dropping out of the sky, as a gift of Hermes, as we used to call it. And so those are the, those are the two senses. Uh, in my own work, you know, there's, there's a certain plodding aspect to when I write prose, but there are always moments when suddenly a sentence appears in my mind or on my page that I really never anticipated and that and, and, uh, just pleases me and excites me. And, you know, if it were, if that never happened, I'm not sure I would, I would do the work. It's kind of what drives us along. I think it's the excitement of it, the mystery of it, the surprise of it, the wonder, I think that drives us as artists to continue on that no matter how many songs have been written, there's still something yet to be discovered. You know, I sometimes think when I'm in a museum or someplace looking at art that really matters to me, that one of the features of, of great art is that it makes you, the audience, a co-participant, that somehow you are able to finish the work by being in its presence. And it often gives me the sense that I could do that. You know, I look at a great painting, I think, oh, maybe I could paint, which of course is a delusion. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, I think it indicates that that I'm in the in the world the artist has made and I, I get to participate somehow in the production of the experience. Mm -hmm. And I think for you know somebody who's being awakened to their own talent, that feeling actually isn't just a delusion. It's the beginning of, of one's own work. I was very struck once by um, a remark in Bob Dylan's autobiography, this book called Chronicles. When he was a kid, 19 years old or so, he first heard the uh, recordings of Woody Guthrie. He said he listened to them all day long, and before too long, he could imitate every one of those songs. But he said, listening to them made me feel more like myself than ever before. And mm -hmm. it's a curious remark, because what is the self that comes into being, that recognizes itself in the presence of somebody else's art? That is, as if Dylan was meant to be a songwriter, and Woody Guthrie's songs awakened in him that part of the self which was already there and dormant. It made me feel more like myself than ever before. So I, sometimes that's the experience of being in the presence of art, even if we're not ourselves a songwriter. We feel some part of our humanity suddenly present to us by the catalyst of this other work. And I think that is one of the beautiful things and, and why art is important and valuable to society as a whole, whether you would identify as an artist or not. The work of the artist serves to awaken wonder within the viewer. One hopes it does, yes. <laughs> it reminds me of something that you said, again, in your introduction on these lines, but you said that we may not have the power to profess our gifts as the artist does, and yet we come to recognize and, in a sense, to receive the endowments of our being 
through the agency of his creation, we feel fortunate, even redeemed. And I thought that was beautifully, beautifully said. It is nicely said. <laughs> and in, in a way, it's, it's, it, it says almost better, you know, that's like the third draft. So it says it much better than what I said a few minutes ago, which is a similar point. <laughs> Well, I could talk with you for hours about the gift and all that this book entails, but I want to give a moment to one of your other books as well, and that is Trickster Makes This World. Uh-huh. And and the subtitle to this one is How Disruptive Imagination Creates Culture. And if I didn't read another word of the book, you had me at the subtitle. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and I love that. But tell me some about what this concept is to you, that how disruptive imagination serves to create culture. Well, maybe I'll begin by explaining the connection between these two books, because um uh, there's some material in the book about gift exchange about the Greek god Hermes, who is the thief and patron of merchants and god of the roads and so forth in ancient Greek culture. And when I was done with the gift, I thought there was more to know about Hermes than I had been able to figure out at that time. And one of the things is that a sort of downside to gift cultures is that they tend to be exclusive. They tend to be having in-group and an out-group there are people who are generous with one another, and then there are other people who who don't ever get the gift. You know, if you're in a in a scientific community and people share their data, but it turns out you're one of the women and the, only the men do it, then it's not so good. So there's always this in-group, out-group business. And in the old story about Hermes, the Greek character, he begins his life as a kind of outsider. Uh, his father is Zeus, but his mother is a kind of unknown nymph. And it's not clear what his status is. Is he one of the Olympians or not? And one of his first acts is to steal the cattle of Apollo. And his mother says, oh, you're a bad kid. You're a shameful kid. You shouldn't have done that. And he says, well, if my father won't give me the offices that I think I deserve, I'm going to steal them. (laughs) So (laughs) that's a kind of hinge point between these two books. Um, that at the edge of gift exchange, you're going to find this, these thieves. And so the thief, like Hermes and the other trickster characters, the tricksters are all, the simple definition is these are sacred boundary crossers. Mm-hmm. So we, there are boundaries all around us, both at the edge of our group. So we have borders to our cities, states, and nations. But also, we have all these internal boundaries. We make distinctions between night and day and life and death and up and down and male and female. And all these are very useful to organize the world. But it turns out that the boundaries also can inhibit us. And uh, the trickster figure is the character who knows how to cross the boundary no matter what. Mm -hmm. And he's sacred in that this turns out to be a necessary function that for some reason, any system, any cosmos is going to slowly solidify and dry out and go dead because things change all around us and the old boundaries stop making sense. So you need some force that's there to interrogate the the structures. And in almost every world religion, uh, anciently, there was one of these characters who uh, serves that function. In the book, I mean, a simple example, I end up using some modern artists to illustrate the point, but one of them who doesn't immediately appear to everyone to be an artist, but nonetheless, I use him as Frederick Douglass, the American slave who mm-hmm. um, was raised in plantation culture in the South, uh, in Maryland, actually, and but who both stole himself out of slavery and stole literacy from the white folks, and then set out to destroy plantation culture by showing that the structures by which it tried to make sense of itself didn't make any sense. Mm -hmm. So you can treat uh, Frederick Douglass as a sacred boundary crosser who, Mm -hmm. in his interrogation of the structure of plantation culture, helped bring it to an end. Amazing. And I love all the stories you tell in there. You talk a lot about the Native American coyote character and a lot of these characters that we see in various myths and ancient texts. 
but I found it to be very applicable to me as an artist and as someone who, you know, I, I think it was, I don't know if you're familiar with Dorothy Sayers. Uh, she was uh, the Anglican theologian and, and the detective novelist. Yeah. But she talked a lot about systems and how the artist is a disruptor of systems because by nature the artist is is the figure that is uh, given to go outside of the known boundaries to discover new worlds and and to create new systems uh, and then uh, continue forward in that way. Yes, exactly. Um, you know, one thing I do in that book is to uh, meditate on the origins of the word art because it comes out of an old uh, root that has to do with joints, you know, like if you have arthritis, <laughs> you have a problem yeah. with your joints. Uh, but the AR part of that word arthritis uh, is the same root as the word art. So I end up saying that the artists, that the tricksters are uh, characters who work with the joints of creation. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes they tear it apart. Sometimes they just move the joints or make them limber. And actually our word harmony begins with an H, but it's from the same root. Uh, and harmony is the, having all the joints correctly arranged. Mm. So, of course, there is a kind of artist who doesn't set out to change things, but just tries to sing the song that brings everything together in the world as it's presented to him. Mm -hmm. But not all artists do that. <laughs> yeah, what is the, uh, I think it's kind of a cultural idiom or a cliche now that art is meant to comfort the disturbed and disturb the comforted. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Something like that. Yes, particularly today. Well, I'd like to ask you one last question, and this one is more of a general question, not so much about your books, but a word of advice for artists who are seeking to find their way through our modern day social climate. What would you say to encourage them as they're working through all the many dynamics that we discussed here today? Well, several things. I mean, if particularly if you're a young person, you know, the problem I think for many artist starting out is that once you get out of college or even in college, I think it takes about 10 years to figure out if you can live with on your gifts, if, if the world has a place for you. And somehow during that 10 years, you need to be supported. Uh, you need to protect yourself. You need to find a place where you can do the work without feeling constantly harassed by the money issue. Um, and it's one of the reasons why we need uh, patrons uh, at at every point in an artist's career, but particularly young people starting out. And the other thing I would say, you know, when people ask me about advice for young artists, um, one thing one should do, I think, is to find some older artist that you care for. Could be somebody centuries dead, could be somebody who's still working, and do a favor for them. Do something for that person. Uh, when I was young, I was much in love with Pablo Neruda's poetry, and I mm -hmm. translated two of Neruda's books. Um, and, you know, it wasn't, uh, it was a way of being close to the work and um, honoring the fact that there were uh, elders. Or, I mentioned Bob Dylan being so interested in Woody Guthrie. You know, when Dylan finally left Minnesota, first thing he did was to go to New York and to find Guthrie himself in a hospital in New Jersey and write a song for him. So on the one hand, we need patrons. On the other hand, young artists need to um, put themselves into the tradition and uh, do something for the community as well as for their own livelihood. So good. Lewis, thank you so much for taking this time to talk with us on Makers and Mystics. I really honor you for the work that you've done and the work that you're doing and for your contribution to working artists. Thank you so much. You are welcome, and thank you for having me on the show. And as always, thank you so much for listening to the Makers and Mystics podcast. If this was your first time listening to the podcast, I hope you enjoyed this conversation and will consider leaving a kind review on iTunes or giving us a follow on Instagram at Makers and Mystics. You can also check out our library of over 100 interviews with leading voices on subjects of art, faith, and culture at makersandmystics.com. If you'd like to go deeper into the conversations, you can join our creative collective at patreon.com slash makersandmystics. We'll have a short interview segment with Lewis Hyde there talking about his most recent book, A Primer for Forgetting, Getting Past the Past. We'll return next week with our next Artist Profile Series episode.